史长河。十二。Human history, like a river, will keep moving forward with moments of both calm waters and huge waves. We have before us the opportunity to forge a new world order. The problem with mo、uh, modern days unipolarity is precisely what is that. The West is leading. Ukraine down the Primrose Path. We don't have enough tanks. We don't have enough vessels. We don't have enough planes to bring chip productions here to the U.S. I'm Andrew Collingwood. I write for Bornbrook Magazine and other online outlets on geostrategy, economics, and British politics. Hi, my name is Philip Pilkington. I'm a macroeconomist who spent nearly a decade working in investment management. Both of us believe that the world is undergoing a once-a-century geopolitical and macroeconomic shift. After decades of American leadership, the unipolar world is finally ending. Since World War II, America has set the terms of global trade, and it's backed these up. With its control over international institutions and its enormous military power, but things are changing. China is still rising. Russia has reawakened. Europe, America's longtime partner, is in long-term decline. Each week, we'll be dissecting three stories that illustrate the shift from how semiconductor shortages in Taiwan influence Japanese military spending to how a new scramble for rare earth metals is remaking U.S. foreign policy. We'll be talking about economics and geopolitics, but most importantly, we'll be talking about how they influence each other, how resource competition drives the great game of empires and alliances, and how that story is the great emerging tale of the 21st century. This is multipolarity. Charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Coming up this week, more and more banks seem to be snapping under the strain of realistic interest rates. With the West now braced for the impact of a full-blown banking crisis, we're celebrating 20 years of failed monetary policy. Is it finally time to stop treating it as a thermostat to be jib- to be jiggled up and down as consumer demand requires? Germany has seen the largest decline for new factory orders on record. Now they're going to introduce a big subsidy to neuter their eye-watering energy bills. Have they just swallowed a spider to catch a fly? Finally, Syria has been readmitted to the Arab League. With Assad having seen off both his internal foes and his global detractors, there are bound to be a few red faces at that first meeting, and a few very different alliances. What does the return of the Arab Spring's one unkillable dictator mean for the balance of Middle Eastern foreign policy? But first. Unwanted interest. A Federal Reserve report, which is published, I think, quarterly, came out this week. It's called the、uh, Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey on Bank Lending, typically known as the SLUS report. The SLUS report gives a fairly decent, I believe, survey overview of how the、uh, banks are thinking about the credit conditions in the economy. By credit conditions, I suppose they don't just mean the actual interest rates, the price at which money is being. Loaned up, but they also mean the willingness of banks to actually lend. So there are two components to bank lending. One of them is price, as I said, that's the interest rate, and the other is willingness to lend. And willingness to lend is effectively willingness of banks to take risk. Now, whether that be risk thought about relative to the individual borrower, so if a bank is willing to take more risk. They might loan to riskier borrowers, or whether it be risk relative to the economy itself. So whether they're looking at economic forecasts and so on, and becoming nervous that borrowers that are currently look like they're good on paper will turn bad when a recession hits, their income dries up, and they're not able to pay their loan anymore. So the Sluice report came out,、um, and it painted a pretty grim picture. Now, this wasn't a completely new development. The previous Sluice report. Uh, had shown some tightening in the credit markets. In fact, some quite dramatic tightening, and it was kind of ignored at the time that it came out. But I guess, I guess the mood has changed a little bit, and people, because of the bank failures and so on, are paying more attention to the possibility that the credit cycle might be turning at the moment. And so, the Sluice report caught the imaginations of the market, and people were talking about it for about two days. And now we can. We can talk about where that went because it went in quite an interesting direction, as in it kind of got buried very quickly. It was it was notable that the markets were paying attention to this metric where they hadn't have、uh, where they where they weren't before, and maybe just to give a little bit of context in terms of 
what a what a credit cycle is. A credit cycle is effectively uh, quite similar to the business cycle, but in the financial markets. So in good times, banks will loan a lot of money. They'll become easy with their lending standards and so on. At a certain point, they'll they'll get nervous. Interest rates will go up. They'll get nervous about certain borrowing classes and so on. They'll pull back lending. And then it's something of a self-fulfilling prophecy because the economy falls into recession, income dries up, people can't pay their loans and you get a wave of defaults and then you end up at the bottom of the cycle. Now, economists debate how much the credit cycle impacts the economy and how much credit cycle causes recessions. I mean, we can talk about that further, but it is definitely at the very least quite predictive of recessions and at the more extreme end, it may even be the primary cause of recessions in the financialized economy. I think this is interesting because it's yet another indicator that indeed the US economy is heading towards rocky shores, shall we say. It's, it, it's looking increasingly likely that a recession is heading America's way. But it's also interesting because it's connected with the what appears to be a slow run, or a slow motion run on bank deposits within the United States. It seems to me very much the case that the banking sector now on several fronts is both in trouble in and of itself and also looking increasingly likely to affect the US economy. And of course, what's important about this is if banks stop lending or if they tighten their lending uh, requirements, they, 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 they tighten their credit requirements, that means less loans go out into the economy, less money goes into the economy. It's more difficult to invest. It's more difficult to spend because of that. And it does have a contractionary uh, impetus on any economy where that actually happens. So I think this is yet another sign that the US and probably the broader West is heading to, towards something that could be quite nasty indeed. Yeah, that's right. I mean, just on the immediate front, you know, you know that the credit cycle has turned when people stop paying their loans, when defaults start occurring. That has not happened in the US right now. It looks like um, they're at the top of the cycle where, where everything's about to kind of fall apart. The UK, I think, is probably already going into the kind of default part of the cycle. We saw, I think it was 700,000 people uh, last month or the month before were unable to repay their, their mortgages and their loans, credit card loans. And they were also, I think, behind on their rent. There's a, a significant number of people in Britain behind on their rent. Now, I think probably the British credit cycle turned quicker because of the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis here. The inflation is much worse. It's 10% here. People's incomes are getting wiped out. The dirty little secret is that Living standards in Britain right now are collapsing. There's no other way of putting it, and it's not really clear how far they have to fall. It's mainly driven by, of course, the energy crisis, which in turn is driven by the sanctions. Uh, I think we've pointed out in the past that it's quite ironic that the country in Europe, at least in Western Europe, that's been most enthusiastic about the war and the sanctions is probably the one that's going to suffer most from the consequences of the war and the sanctions. In terms of the broader picture on the credit cycle, I think it's interesting to note, you, you, you raised the, um, the fact that the banks are collapsing. Of course, we won't go into the mechanics of that again, we've dealt with it in the previous podcast, but the short version is the banks are collapsing due to the Fed's monetary policy tightening. I think it's worth pointing out, as we probably head into the rough part of the current credit cycle, that this is kind of the way things work now. The way that monetary policy is advertised to the population is as almost an engineering problem. Like we have Federal Reserve economists who uh, you know, think deeply about these things and build models and so on, and they engage in interest rate manipulation almost as if they can, it's like a thermostat. You turn the economy up, you turn it down. Now, monetary policy has been ascendant basically since the early 90s. And since then, the economy has become financialized. In fact, the period of monetary policy becoming predominant was tied to the financialization of the economy. I think the irony is that as the economies become more financialized, in part due to the use of monetary policy, the, the way that monetary policy works has been diverging more and more from the textbook thermostat version. And instead, what monetary policy tightening does and monetary policy loosening does is it promotes financial excesses. And then when it's tightened, those financial excesses unwind. And institutions that have been hollowed out 
and have become fragile like the banks we see today or like people who are overextended on credit card debt or on mortgages, they get squeezed to bits. So I think the real irony here, and we're going to learn this for the third time, this is the third time that a rate hike cycling by the Federal Reserve will cause a financial crisis. There was a minor one when the stock market collapsed in, in 2000. There was a major one in 2008 that everybody remembers. And we'll probably get another one in either 2023 or 2024. I think at a certain point, we have to accept that this is how the modern economic management system in the West works. And the Federal Reserve and the economists are not telling the truth about this. They're saying that these are anomalies, that these financial crises that we get every single time there's a Federal Reserve rate hike are some sort of a, um, an anomaly, something that was caused by poor regulation, something that can be solved. Well, if we get another one, I think it's time to turn around and throw our hands up and say, no, wait, this is actually what the rate hike cycling is all about. This is completely predictable. When we have easy money policies, the banks load up on risk, become fragile, become addicted to low interest rates. And then when the inflation comes along and the Fed hikes rates, the whole system that's become a complete house of cards collapses before our very eyes. So I hope that coming out of this cycle, we start to ask serious questions about the way that we manage our economies. And at the very least, that we start telling the truth about the nature of this system and stop pre pretending that PhD economists running the show have some sort of a thermo thermostat where they can turn uh, a too hot economy down a few, a, few, a few degrees Celsius or a too cool economy up a few degrees Celsius. That's not how this works. Actually, that's very interesting. It's something that I've never thought. Of course, monetary policy gained increasing prominence in the late 70s and early 80s with the work of Milton Friedman and also on both sides of the Atlantic, Britain, Margaret Thatcher's government with two chancellors of the Exchequer who were great monetarists attempted to squeeze inflation out of the economy by increasing interest rates quite significantly. But of course, there was an even more famous episode of that in the United States with Paul Volcker in the early 80s. I think Krugman said that uh, Volcker increased interest rates until he thought the economy had had enough. And it, you know, it was a real effort to uh, crush the demand side of the economy and, 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 and therefore deal with inflation that way, essentially contract the money supply until the pip squeaked, essentially. But you know, rapidly after that, you had this you know, absolute golden moment with low inflation, low interest rates, fairly high GDP growth, again, on both sides of the Atlantic. In the in the 1990s, it happened in Britain after the, the ERM disaster, which we won't go into. Uh, but it also happened it was the Clinton boom in the 90s in America as well. And on both sides of the Atlantic, you had a, a, this absolute golden economic era where you had very low sovereign debt. And in fact, in America, sovereign debt was being paid down in the Clinton era. And being paid down at a rate that Alan Greenspan was, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time, was wondering what the heck they were going to do to manipulate money, monetary policy if US debt went to zero. That's how quickly it was being paid down. But in the UK, you had a similar boom. And uh, certainly by the time Tony Blair entered office in 1997, 98, it was a golden economic legacy. But then very quickly after that, you had this grand a dot-com crash, which you mentioned, and uh, Greenspan essentially had to deck rates right down to zero. And uh, really, you know, we had the Greenspan put where he started taking things uh, to his balance sheet and he had the, the collapse of the long-term, um, I forget the name of the hedge fund, um, long-term financial management hedge fund, I want to say, uh, in, in the US. You also had the Asian financial crisis and the collapse of the, Russian economy and the Russian default as well. And you had all of these things happening. You had interest rates go right down to zero. And since then, it, it, it seems there's been this cycle of low interest rates to kind of lift, try to lift the economy off the shoals, and then financial excesses, then an almighty burst, forcing the central banks essentially to, to deck interest rates to the bottom again. And again, you have this growth, mainly in the financial sector. I mean, after 2008, the real economy grew 
at a truly sclerotic pace. You know, jobs were added very slowly. It took ages to kind of lift the economy off the bottom. But the financial markets went much faster and much higher. Uh, and it seems we're in this cycle. And it, 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 I hadn't considered the fact that it was maybe the dominance of monetary policy in and of itself that was causing that. I mean, what are the mechanics of that, Philip? How might that work in a nutshell? I wouldn't say it's the only cause. And I'd say that the um, predominance of monetary policy is reflective of other broader global trends that push policymakers to manage the economy in that way. But there are direct connections. I mean, you referred to one yourself, the Greenspan put. These are clearly attempts by central banks to manipulate financial markets, to make CEOs and investors think that they should invest more. I mean, that's the, that's the whole reason for pulling interest rates down, for engaging in any sort of Greenspan put. I mean, it's a trick. Let's, let's call it what it is. It's a mind trick. You're going out and you're trying to mess with the psychology of investors. You're giving them a low price as well, a low price of money, a low interest rate. Yes, of course, that's a real thing. You're paying less for the money that you're borrowing to invest. But most money that's invested in the economy, most economy-wide investment is not driven by borrowed funds. And it's not even driven by equity issuance. It's driven by retained earnings big firms reinvesting their earnings. That's where the vast majority of investment comes in modern capitalist economies. It's only at the margin that people are taking out debt to invest in real economic activity. So one thing that the um, monetary policy mind trick does is that it, it, it juices what Keynes used to call the animal spirits of investors. It gets them all convinced that the cycle's turning, and then they invest and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The other thing that it does is it drives, obviously, asset markets, equity markets, and so on, and that can release higher consumption into the economy. It's called the wealth effect in economics. If you feel like your stock portfolio is doing well and you're getting nice dividends, you're more inclined to spend money. But the wealth effect doesn't have that, that much of an impact on the economy, but it does somewhat juice consumption. The big thing, the big direct link between monetary policy and the economic cycle is housing. Housing drives the cycle. It has for the past 25 years. Housing reprices every time interest rates go low. House prices go high, up, up, up. And that causes people to go in and build more property. And building requires a lot of employment in the construction sector. It requires a lot of inputs, you know, large-scale inputs. Think cement, think bricks, all of this. It's a very kind of, it's, I wouldn't call it an intense industry because that might, you know, bring to mind a really intensive factory, which will probably be more productive and so on. But it's not a services industry. It's a real bricks and mortar industry. You're building something, so it requires a lot of uh, inputs and so on. It is a high economic multiplier effect, economists might say. And it's completely dominated by the monetary policy cycle. And that's why I think the big economic collapse here is going to come when the U.S. housing market goes sour. And uh, since credit conditions are already tightening in that sector, I think that'll probably be... I think it'll probably be this year, but it might be the start of next year. But those are the mechanisms by which the interest rate steers the economy, and none of them are stable. It's it's anywhere between psychological mind tricks on investors to juicing people's stock portfolios to get them to consume more, or just juicing the housing market, driving up the valuation of property to pull in more construction. These are really reckless ways of managing the economy. And the fact that we're still lying about the fact that this is how we manage our economies, it's almost criminal at this stage. If we do not wake up to what's really going on after another cycle, then I don't know what to say. Forget about it. We're living in a fantasy world. I'll just give some context about how bad this has gotten because I think I think in the previous cycles, um, the Fed could have claimed naivete. They could have said that they were being responsible and so on. But since 2008, the central banks have gone completely gangbusters with this stuff, with their quantitative easing programs, all sorts of crazy monetary experiments that were discussed in theoretical economics papers and so on. And by the way, none of them really lifted the economy out of stagnation. All they did was drive up asset markets, get the housing market going again. That's how this stuff works. It, it, it's a bit of a mind trick. 
the interesting thing is that the, the Fed in this period just became completely reckless. They convinced themselves that all the excesses could be contained through these new financial regulations that were were passed in the Dodd-Frank Act. And, and then they pretended as well that inflation was never coming back. Goldman Sachs this week released some research showing that the Federal Reserve since 2011 had never, ever stress tested the banking system for serious rate hikes. In over 10 years, they'd never stress tested the banking sector. They were constantly stress testing it for what would happen if they drove rates lower. That's crazy. That means that not only did the Fed assume that inflation was never coming back and that interest rates would never go up, but no one of the thousands of top economists with PhDs that they employ, nobody stood up at a meeting and said, shouldn't we stress test it just in case? If you came across an asset manager that had done something like this, I mean, it's negligence. Oh, you didn't stress test your portfolio for rate hikes or for inflation? Well, why didn't you do that? That seems really irresponsible. Well, the Fed didn't stress test the banking sector for their highly experimental monetary policy. I mean, at a certain point, a scandal's got to break here, and people have to look at what these economists have been doing and ask serious questions. But, you know, I, from what I've seen, I don't think people are going to ask. I think we're in some sort of a weird spiral now where after 2008, people got really angry and they demanded accountability. And if we get another turn of this cycle, it'll just be fatigue and people will just go, oh, again, again, this just keeps happening. And at a certain point, if a system becomes so dysfunctional, people just get kind of they get kind of bummed out and they don't even want to talk about it anymore. We'll see what happens after this cycle. But the bodies are buried everywhere on this one. Yeah, you see that a lot in uh, emerging economies where countries have really been broken economically, socially, and politically. And the degree of political apathy and unwillingness to engage in communities and uh, socially is, is, is really something to behold. It, you know, it does tend to crush people's uh, spirit in that way. But it, it, you know, it's actually quite worrying to listen to what you're saying in general because. As we've covered on the podcast more than once in the past, the banks are already struggling with the interest rates through the channel of their capital, right? They they, they buy uh, U.S. sovereign debt and and uh, mortgage backed securities as a way of holding capital on their books. But when interest rates increase, that ascent, that actually means that the value of those bonds that they hold, both sovereign bonds and mortgage-backed bonds, falls. It's like another way of saying interest rates are higher. I mean, it's another way of saying that bonds are worth less. And of course, when their capital is worth less, it means they've got less on hand to deal with uh, any large withdrawals or with any kind of slow motion run on their banks, which they're suffering at the moment. And of course, this is what's at the core of the uh, of the bank collapses that we've already seen now. If we see banks starting to struggle through the credit cycle channel as well, whereby they start tightening credit requirements and giving out fewer loans, and that means that businesses and homeowners and individuals can't, consumers can't roll over their debt, whether it be unsecured consumer loans and credit card debt, or whether it be their mortgages, or whether it be the the bonds that they've sold as businesses. If if they they can't then roll that over and you start seeing an increase in defaults. And again, at present, I think, you know, in the, in the Eurozone, for example, the, you know, the bad loan rate in Europe for banks is like 2% at the moment. There's no sign of this happening. But if it does start to happen and you start seeing banks being battered by defaults in addition to increased interest rates, then, you know, you are in, you know, banking crisis territory indeed, aren't you? Yes, and at that point, it will become too obvious to ignore the quantitative easing programs, the zero interest rate policy program has very likely destroyed the banking system in a much more profound way than the banking system committed suicide in 2008 by uh, loading up with mortgage debt. That was their decision. They took those risks. Regulators looked the other way. Okay, but still, they took those risks. This cycle, if what looks like is about to happen, is about to happen, 
this is all the Fed's fault. This is all the central bank's fault. They engaged in reckless monetary experiments that didn't lift the economy out of stagnation, and they destroyed the financial system. And by the way, central banks were founded not to control the economy or to jiggle with interest rates. They were founded to protect and bank stop and render stable the banking system. So this is like, this is the central banks doing the exact opposite of what their core mandate is. It's absolutely crazy. And again, I'll say, I just think it's so, so beyond the pale in a sense that, that people may not even be able to look it in the eye after it happens, but I guess we'll see. The deindustrial revolution. One thing that low interest rates certainly didn't do is help the industrial sector in the West. We've had a, a long period of uh, deindustrialization in the West. The super low interest rates did not encourage industrial companies to invest at scale, and deindustrialization has continued. But recently, that has been given a boost by uh, the European decision to sanction Russian energy. That's essentially uh, breathed oxygen into the fire of deindustrialization. And one of the biggest losers of that is Germany. Yeah. So just to give some context on this, I think we've been, we've talked about deindustrialization in the past. The mechanism is quite simple. It's higher energy costs destroy European industry because the two biggest costs for, for industry, heavy industry, are labor, obviously human labor, and energy. And if they don't have the cheap energy, uh, it'll be cheaper to produce that stuff elsewhere. It's already a very low margin business. It's already a highly competitive business. You've already got disadvantages in somewhere like Germany because you have relatively high wage costs. Now, Germany have very low wage costs relative to the rest of Europe, but they don't have low wage costs relative to, say, China. So they already have to have to try and compete with those slightly higher wage costs. And so if you stick a big energy bill on top, um, it's not going to work. The deindustrialization narrative at the beginning of the energy crisis got some traction, and I was actually quite surprised. But it quickly faded from view amidst a sea of headlines of how energy price futures were coming down and how the energy crisis was solved. I've never understood how people can believe those headlines and at the same time pay their current energy bills. It's If people believe this, it's, they must not pay their own energy bills. Their secretary must be doing it because your energy bills are still very high. Um, and it feels like that old Marx Brothers joke, who are you going to believe, uh, me or your lying eyes? So, I mean, the deindustrialization narrative was basically buried under a bunch of positive headlines. Since then, I've been pointing out on Twitter that the PMI indices have been showing deindustrialization uh, starting. The arguments against that have been twofold. Uh, one of them is kind of like, People who think that it, when you say something's going to deindustrialize, that we'll wake up one day and there won't be any factories. That's not how deindustrialization works. If people want an, an example of deindustrialization, look at Italy after the euro. Its industry slowly falls apart as it is unable to devalue. It used to devalue the lira all the time because of its rising labor costs. When it was unable to do that, it wasn't able to compete with German wages. And industry just flatlined since about 2000. Italian industry, I mean, it wasn't completely destroyed, but it, it was largely destroyed. Britain deindustrialized famously in the 1980s. Different cause was due to high interest rates and so on. But that deindustrialization took all of the Thatcher era, and then it really sped up in the Blair era. So deindustrialization takes time. So the people who, who, who say, you, you called deindustrialization three months ago, and it hasn't happened yet. I mean, that's Look, it's not a serious argument, but just in case people hear of it, you know that, that those are the that's the reality of it. The other argument against the PMI data was that it's it's survey data. You know, it's just going around and surveying uh, uh, manufacturing uh, distributors, I think, uh, or the people who engage with the distributors and talking about the amount of orders and the amount of production that's coming out and so on. The deindustrialization wasn't showing up in the physical data. So that will be physical factory orders, actual numbers of factory orders. That will be a physical industrial output. Well, this week that changed. Um, Germany saw the largest decline 
um, for new factory orders on record. Now, there's only one larger decline, and that was in uh, during the pandemic, but that was a completely freak event, and it very quickly reversed itself. That was a, a single quarter where you know everybody went to bed for <laughs> three months. We all remember it. It wasn't that long ago. So you can't, we should almost be cutting cutting the pandemic era out of all economic data because it was so unusual. The current decline that we're seeing in Germany is a 10% decline, which uh, is, is larger than anything we saw in 2008. Now, we have to think about this for a minute. In 2008, we had a huge recession. When the recession hits, people stop buying stuff from factories, and so, and does, and so factory orders decline. We're now seeing a bigger decline in factory orders without a recession. That should be a big red light because and because we're about to get a recession as well. So how if if it can decline ten percent, which is the biggest on record, barring the pandemic era, what will a recession do on top of that? This should be a big red flashing light. That is a very 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 bad data signal. The industrial production numbers are also pretty bad. They'll take longer to come through. That's a, a longer term series. But the people who were saying that the survey data was misleading because it wasn't showing up in the in the physical data. They can't say that anymore. The factory orders are down. There is strong evidence that German industry is suffering really, really badly. How long will this take? I don't think it'll take, if, if it continues on like it is, I don't think it'll take as long as it took Italy or as long as it took Britain. Those are about 20-year examples. We're not looking at in three months here. But I don't think we're looking at 20 years either. I think we're looking at five to 10 years. I think one of the things that a lot of people perhaps don't realize is just how important energy is for industrial production. It sounds obvious, but it's one of the things that you often miss. For instance, uh, you mentioned Britain was one of the first of the Europe, Western European countries to deindustrialize. And one of the reasons that deindustrialization is, uh, continues is simply because uh, energy in the United Kingdom is so expensive. It, it, it's far more expensive even than elsewhere in Western Europe. So, for instance, Britain has a, a constant and ongoing process where it has to consistently bail out and sort of tr try to sell off or, or, or try to uh, subsidize and find a way to maintain what little is left of its steel industry. And the primary reason for this is because energy is extremely expensive and, and energy is one of the primary inputs of steel. And to varying degrees, that is true across the industrial sector. Now, if we look at Germany in particular, if we think essentially of, of Germany as one big factory, okay, you know, its economy is, is more than any other European nation based on industrial production of various types from, from big, expensive, complicated capital goods and uh, highly engineered uh, the, uh, goods, uh, right down to things like uh, fertilizer and chemical production and car manufacturing and all of the various manufactured inputs that go into those industries as well. So if we imagine Germany as one big factory, the, the way it's worked, the model has been over the last kind of 30 years that inexpensive energy would come from pipelines from Russia and specifically from Siberia. And that would essentially be the fuel that was inputted into the German manufacturing model, the German economic model, essentially, because of what happened in terms of foreign policy and diplomacy uh, between about 2007 and 2022, and then the European reaction to what happened in 2022 with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and their decision to sanction Russia and to cut themselves off from essentially the fuel that allowed them to have a successful and large manufacturing sector. We now have a situation where energy is much more expensive in Europe. And as you correctly say, the futures market did indeed spike uh, quite frighteningly in 2022, and energy prices went up across the board. Now we've had a situation where a lot of people in the media, and I'm sure our listeners of Reddit, have been um, dancing a celebration, dancing a victory jig that they've got beyond this energy crisis because the futures market is now back down to somewhere close to, to pre-invasion levels or a little bit above that. But here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. If they're going to import LNG, 
that is by definition significantly, maybe 50% more expensive than Russian pipeline gas. So at the very least, if they're never going to buy Russian pipeline gas again, even if the market rationalizes, even if there's enough LNG to cover Europe's industrial needs, that's still going to be considerably more expensive. And I think that, as you correctly say, anybody who still gets their gas bill at the end of the month, the the gas and electricity bill, which in Britain, I don't know about elsewhere in Europe, but in Britain, it's, it's really quite a lot higher than it was. It's a big chunk out of the out of the family budget more than we were paying in the past. And anecdotally, I've been reading it's quite similar in Germany as well, where utilities bills are, are really considerably more expensive at the moment. And that's bad enough for the consumer. But for the industrial sector, where margins are actually very thin, and quite often profits are made based on scale, you know, you have thin margins, but uh, a big industry that produces a lot so that you can make decent profits, that's going to be a killer. I mean, we all know and accept that, for instance, German cars are wonderful cars, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, and even their less expensive cars like Volkswagen are superb. They're really good cars, but are they so much better than Lexuses? Are they so much better than Hyundais and Kias? Are they so much better than Cherries and Geelys, where they have even lower energy costs and even lower labor costs again? So I think what we're starting to get is at the margin, we've already seen energy intensive industries like uh, fertilizer production, where natural gas is the key input to that. And fertilizer production in Europe has gone to the dust. Things like more artisan industries like glass blowing, for example, that's struggling badly. That's gone to the dust. Things like metal smelting, where again, that is, you know, high energy intensive, that's gone to the dust. BASF, one of the biggest German chemical producers, has relocated out of Germany or they've relocated some of their plant out of Germany. But what you'll get is at the margin, more and more businesses going to the wall, relocating elsewhere, or just not expanding. And as you say, we'll get this kind of slow motion deindustrialization. And I think it's it's very difficult to underestimate the kind of impact that that's had. You just have to look at a country like Britain where – you know, we really struggle to improve productivity and the way that people live better in a sustainable way, not as we were speaking before about taking on vast amounts more consumer credit because interest rates are on the deck, but how people live better in a sustainable way is that economies become more productive and that improved productivity is shared throughout the economy with individuals. But hey, it's much more difficult to increase productivity in the service sector than it is in the manufacturing sector. The manufacturing sector also tends to provide a lot of high quality jobs for blue collar workers. You know, it's, it's much better to work in a factory than it is to work as a shop assistant, for example, in terms of wages and stability and all of the rest of it. What we'll see is as Europe struggles to get its industrial production back on trend it is you know instead you get stagnation and instead of this trend and so that you know 15 10 15 years down the line you've got a huge gap from where you would have been compared to where you are now what we might see is the kind of the anglicization of the western european economy where you have low productivity low productivity growth you struggle to produce high quality blue collar jobs and i think that not just economically but socially and politically that's of first order importance yeah just to give kind of an update on the energy situation in europe um if people have been tracking the natural gas imports which i'm sure they haven't it's not it's an obscure hobby. It actually looked like something might be moving. So until um, about week 13 of this year, gas imports were at record lows. Um, and it was very concerning. And and I, I at the time then assumed, look, these have been... Uh, these have been at about this level now for quite some time. They probably can't move beyond it. Well, in week 15, 16, 17 we saw a spike uh, in imports and it was due to a, a large spike in LNG imports. LNG actually broke, I think, their old time record there one week. Now, this spike was higher than the uh, lowest. <laughs> so it was very much so the tallest dwarf, their records. It looked like um, gas imports were getting back to about mid-level given this spike. That has now reversed. 
we can't really tell what's going on behind the statistics, but that is reversed and imports are heading back down to their record low levels. So basically, people can think of it as between weeks, say, 7 and 23 every year, there's a big kind of hump where imports imports increase for quite a few weeks. They increase, 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 then they peak, and then they go down slowly. And in that period, we get an awful lot of imports. It looks more like this year it's going to be record low, record low, and then a little spike, and then back down. So it looks pretty bad. It doesn't look like that spike is going to keep growing, and it doesn't look like it's particularly sustainable. In the news uh, this week, I think it was released on Sunday, the German government said that they were considering a plan to subsidize 80% of energy costs for energy intensive industries until 2030. Now, there's a lot that can be said about this. I mean, the first thing to say is that this is clearly a response to the American Inflation Reduction Act. I think the outrage about the IRA was slightly feigned because the IRA, I think we've discussed on a previous podcast, isn't all it's cracked up to be. It's more of a green policy than an industrial policy. But that seems to have given the Germans anyway the feeling that they can engage in some sort of large-scale industrial policy. Well, this looks like it's what it's going to be. I guess the second question is... um, subsidizing 80% of the energy costs for their industry, will that work in preserving their industry? I can't see any reason that it won't. I mean, if the government really drives down the price of energy to a competitive level by shoveling money into those industries, it should keep their competitiveness. So there's no free lunch, right? How, wh- where, does, where, does the, um, where does the cost accrue on that? Well, I think we've seen recently how expensive these energy subsidies are. They are by far, in the UK, for households and businesses, they are by far the biggest line item on the, on, the, on the government budget. I mean, maybe some ministries are bigger, but they drive the budget deficit, which is important. So you have a large weighty budget that's been growing for years, and then various things can slide into that budget that throw it into deficit or surplus. And this is throwing it into deficit. It's a bit like it's a bit like taking an extra three holidays in the year. Although they don't take up all of your income, they make such a difference to the to your balance sheet that you're basically broke. So if Germany engage in these 80% subsidies up until 2030, and these are not uncontroversial even in Germany. So they may not do it or they may get reversed. We'll see. I think they probably will end up doing it. Their fiscal space will all be gone. The Germans pride themselves on having a very good public sector. They have very good roads. They have very good rail, good infrastructure. Germany is a well-run, efficient country. It really is. If they do these subsidies, all of that fiscal space will be taken up. There won't be anything else to do anything else. So, I mean, that's at the very least. The other potential is that it could have inflationary consequences. But honestly, that's a mixed bag because... It could actually bring down energy costs for businesses, which get passed on to consumers. So I don't think it's a particularly terrible uh, policy, given the the circumstances. I'd probably do the same in their position. But there could be kind of hidden nasties down the track. But more than that, I think it's basically going to render the German government effectively broke and completely constrained in doing anything else. And I think public services and so on will deteriorate rapidly in Germany. Now, I'd just say at the end of it, how they don't see they see the solution here as enormous subsidies to blow out their government deficit, and they don't see the solution at the least engaging in some sort of new energy policy and stopping the greenification of their economy, which is not working well for them. I don't know. But then, at, you know, at a more maximalist approach, I don't know why they're not eyeing up some way to get that Russian gas flowing. The sanctions haven't worked. We've talked about that before. There's peace talks being floated between the Chinese. The Americans are backing the Chinese. The, the war will come to an end, hopefully by the end of the year. And I don't know why they're, why they're not angling to, to try and figure out a way to get that gas pipeline going. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. But that seems to be the, the path of least resistance. That said... Could the subsidies save Germany from total deindustrialization? Maybe. But it will mean they probably sacrificed their entire public sector to do it. Or at least it's efficient. Yeah, if you look at the sums of money that the European nations earmarked last year, uh, 
to subsidize energy costs for consumers and industry, the numbers were obviously unsustainable given current spending on other things. Obviously unsustainable. They were running into the trillions just for, you know, uh, you know, just for a year, which is, uh, I did the sums on these. And as a percentage of GDP for Europe overall, the subsidies for energy, that what did earmarked? I'm not sure saying that they spent all of that because futures prices went up and down and we don't quite know what the end cost to consumers and to industry was, but just the money that they earmarked, it was something like two or three times the amount that these countries spent on defense as a percentage of GDP. Now, if Germany's talking about subsidizing 80% of, the, of gas consumption or gas cost for industry, that's going to be another huge amount. Now, if any country in Europe has got the fiscal space to do that, it's Germany. But boy, it's going to leave them pretty threadbare when it comes to things like capital investment and infrastructure and healthcare and schools, all of these things that have made Germany such a powerhouse, basically. So it, it's going to be very interesting how they cope with that. I would add to that that if Germany is going to start subsidizing their industry to this degree, there's going to be hell to pay on an EU-wide level. There was already serious murmurings last year from some of the some of the poorer states like uh, Spain and Italy that were basically saying we do not have the fiscal room to subsidize our industry in this way, and it's going to cause a whole range of distortions within the single market. It's going to lead essentially to unfair competition. Now, if Germany is going to subsidize its industry to the sort of huge level that you're talking about here. That surely is going to suck industry out of other countries. I mean, Italy still is the European Union's second largest industrial economy, despite the sanction, despite the stagnation you mentioned recently. It was also extremely exposed to Russian gas, especially after the 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 the, the drawdown of gas that uh, came from Libya after the conflict in that country, and the fact that it's currently a failed state. Italy is going to really suffer, and, uh, and surely this is going to just suck industry out. So I would say that, you know, quite apart from a fiscal perspective in Germany, I think we should be looking at this on a political perspective as well, because it really has the potential to start fracturing political consensus within the European Union. Arab autumn. Another piece of news has come from the Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East in general which points to a normalization of relations between various nations and powers in that region, uh, but also suggests a reorganization of the geopolitics within the region. So the news came that um, the Arab League, which is the primary diplomatic organization through which Arab countries uh, communicate and se seek to foster cooperation and mutual benefit, it covers not just the Arabian Peninsula, but North Africa and some of East Africa as well. The Arab League has moved to readmit Syria to the Arab League. Syria's membership was suspended in November 2011, so uh, more than 10 years ago now. And it actually reached an idea in 2014, where the Arab League, the Secretary General of the Arab League at the time, said that Syria would only be readmitted once opposition organizations had started rebuilding and putting in place the institutions of Syria that would then be able to interact with other Arab countries. So they were talking about, you know, they were so certain that Assad was done as leader of that country that they were talking about readmitting Syria once the opposition had managed to reform the institutions of the country. But now, Assad is being, or Syria is being readmitted, and it means that Assad himself will be able to attend the next Arab League summit, which I believe is this month or shortly after this month. You need to look at the schedule for that. I think this is important because it shows essentially that the Arab world has come to the conclusion that the Syrian civil war is for all intents and purposes over, that Assad has won that Assad is a fact of life and he's here to stay as leader of the sovereign state of Syria. So we've seen 
normalization of relations between the Saudi Arabians and the Syrians and between the, the Emirate nations and the Syrians. And now we're getting Syrian reintroduction into the Arab League, which essentially brings them back into the full fold of full diplomatic status within the region. It's a significant blow. And, and, and this is the key point. It is a significant blow to the US policy in the region, which was to remove Assad. They supported the Arab Spring throughout the region. They backslid in Egypt when they didn't like the result of the Arab Spring. And ultimately, they have failed in Syria to remove Assad through support of the opposition groups. And this is a recognition of that by the Arab world. And it's also saying that the US view on this does not matter because the US opposed the readmission of Syria to the Arab League. And the Arab League is saying, we don't care. It's another example of the Arab world shifting from broad US alliance, very strong US alliance uh, in places like Saudi Arabia, but less so in other parts of the region. So they're shifting from broad US alliance to more of a neutral or balancing power within the region. It's another sign that US influence within the region is very much on the wane and has waned precipitously. Yeah, I think the first thing to say about it is, I guess, to emphasize your point that the Syrian civil war is over, effectively. Um, I think that's worth thinking about a little bit. Um, a friend of mine has pointed out to me many times this year that we never really recognized the loss of the Syrian civil war. I mean, I don't know if people remember when the Sy Syrian civil war was in full swing, but it, it really did dominate newspaper headlines. It wasn't quite as focused on as the Ukraine war, for obvious reasons. It wasn't in Europe. And of course, the, the support for the rebels wasn't as pronounced, uh, remotely as pronounced, as the support that's been forthcoming for the Ukrainians. But it did get an awful lot of media attention. And we have really were told for a very, very long time that Assad was not going to win the war and that the Russian intervention on his behalf and so on was fruitless. And it's quite remarkable if you look back and you remember those headlines to think now that um, they were completely wrong. The Syrians won. They're back in the Arab League. There's no point in denying it anymore. I guess the interesting thing is certainly the Syrians have declared victory. Certainly the people in the Middle East, at least the leadership, understand that reality. The Russians likely understand that reality. The Chinese likely understand that reality. And I'd imagine even the Americans reluctantly understand that reality. The vast majority of people do not. It just disappeared. It disappeared from view. And I think that'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting to see how the, how the Ukraine war is dealt with when peace talks begin. The other thing, I guess it's emphasizing another one of your points again, that the countries here that have recognized Syria and accepted it back into the Arab League, you say that they've bucked the United States' influence, and they certainly have done that. But I think it's also worth emphasizing these are very independent-minded countries, surprisingly so. I don't think people with a passing familiarity of the Middle East, not a deep expertise, but a reasonable knowledge of it, 10, 15 years ago would have thought of the likes of Saudi Arabia or UAE as a highly independent-minded state. We'd have thought of them as, you know, kind of being told what to do by bigger powers. And the, and the independent-minded states in the region, we would have associated with the bodies, frankly, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, the Iran of the Mullahs. So independent-minded states, at least in my mind, was always, if they were Middle East and they were independent-minded, it meant that they were, um, that they were on, the, on the bad list, on the naughty list. But now you're seeing a, a flourishing of, of independent-mindedness in the region, and I think it'll have very, very long-term consequences for a region that's been always at the mercy of larger powers, or at least in, in modern history. I mean, obviously not throughout all of history. It, it has its own history. In recent history, it, it really has been subordinated. The, the third thing that sticks out is, um, as far as I can tell, the only major country to kind of push back was Qatar. Now, that's not that surprising. Qatar is quite close to the West and so on. I think the one thing that would be interesting to comment on there is if we recall during the football about a year ago, I think, maybe 18 months ago, there was a, um, there was a lot of bad press around Qatar. I think it had to do with LGBT rights issues, although I may be wrong. I wonder if that sort of thing will stop now. Um, I say I wonder. If you want my opinion, I don't think it will stop. I think this is the modus operandi of uh, Western 
uh, diplomacy these days. But it'll be interesting to see if it does or it doesn't stop. If it does stop, that means that um, that maybe we're we're taking another look at countries like Qatar and saying, do we really want to expand our diplomatic capital with them by lecturing them? And if it doesn't stop, I think we can assume that the diplomatic doom spiral is uh, is continuing on. I think there are a few things to discuss here. The first is that we're at the end of a long period uh, that really started in 2003 with the US invasion of Iraq. By removing Saddam Hussein and essentially putting sparks into the tinderbox of Iraqi social and sectarian affairs and taking the country into chaos, where let's not forget, at one stage, not very long ago, the Islamic State ruled a considerable portion of Iraq. You have bits which are semi-autonomous under the Kurds, for example. Uh, you have bits which are under the control of Sunni and under the control of Shia. It's not really a, the, the, the sort of strong and functioning unitary state that it had been under Saddam Hussein. I'm not saying that Saddam Hussein was a nice person. He obviously wasn't. I'm just describing the difference between the the state of Iraq now and uh, in, in terms of its unity and its strength compared with the Saddam era Iraq. And, uh, and what that did essentially is the primary winner of the Iraq war was Iran. It essentially allowed Iran to extend its influence right into Iraq. Uh, it's the most, the single most influential state in Iraq today, and also into the Iranian, the the Arabian Peninsula proper. What that did in turn was that started worrying the Saudis, and in addition to the chaos caused by the Iraq War itself and the sort of people that that the it, the Iraq War, of course, created an environment for all kinds of nasty groups to fester and grow. And of course, then you had the Arab Spring, which came just after, which was heavily supported by the United States. I can't say to what extent, whether it was just verbal or the, whether there was physical support through intelligence agents on the ground. We don't know, and we perhaps never will know. Uh, but you know, you had this confluence of events that really put the whole region into chaos. You had governments overthrown, you had revolutions, you had military strongmen taken over and then being removed and so on and so forth. The Muslim Brotherhood at one stage got an electoral grip over Egypt, which was one of the biggest and most powerful nations in the region. Um, you had a civil war in Syria, which involved heavily the Islamic State. It involved uh, a, a wide variety of jihadists. It involved outside powers of the United States and Russia, for example. And what we're seeing now, essentially, is the slow end of that period of bloodshed, of war, and of chaos. Uh, you, you might even want to roll uh, the Israeli uh, normalization of relations with countries like Saudi Arabia into this. But certainly, certainly the Chinese brokered deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the end of the war in Yemen, the, uh, the fostering of stronger relations between Saudi Arabia and Syria by both China and Russia, the effort to normalize relations between the Assad regime and Turkey by Russia, all of these things are moving the region away from this period of bloodshed and chaos and into, uh, into an era of much greater stability. And at the same time, you have China entering as the biggest purchaser of energy from the region, which of course is the region's biggest export and a much bigger player in diplomacy within the region as well. Now, to move on to the next point with regard to uh, Western the Western tendency these days to hector and henpeck, perhaps we can even say countries, for their supposed or apparent lack of human rights, you know, their inability to treat homosexuals or transgender people or women or, or all of these things that are seem to be of tremendous importance in the West, but are perhaps of less importance in foreign current countries. And we therefore feel it's our duty to uh, lecture these countries on those matters. I'm afraid to say that the days when we could do that are gone. They're just gone. In a multipolar world, security takes precedence over morality. Security takes precedence over the ideology of 
an individual power. You have to make decisions made based on cold, hard reality in your national or your power block's interests. So I think that, in fact, as the Arab world starts to stabilize, as it starts to regain its strength, of course, there will still be rivalries and diplomatic issues and and conflicts diplomatically between nations of that region. The interests of Saudi Arabia are not aligned with the interests of Iran, and the interests of Turkey are not aligned with the interests of Iraq. So, the, you know, I'm not saying they're going to form one great power block, but the stability itself will allow them to have more strategic room for maneuver. The fact that China has entered the region as a serious player will again give them more room for maneuver. And they will now start to be able to balance between external powers rather than being beholden to one external power and becoming, as you say, a kind of a piece on the chessboard of greater external powers. Getting back to Europe and deindustrialization, this is going to be of paramount importance to Europe because if it's not going to buy Russian gas, it needs to buy gas from somewhere. And Qatar is one of the key producers of LNG. And it is one of the places that Europe has turned to, to make up the shortfall. So I think in, in increasingly, Europe is going to have to be careful what it does with the Arab world diplomatically. It's going to have to be more careful about what it says. And it's going to have to play nicely in that area of the world because they desperately need and, and need more now than they did two years ago um, Arab energy and in addition to that the Arabs now have a degree of stability and they also have other places they can turn to they don't have to sell to Europe they don't have to be nice to Europe they don't have to have good relations because there's the Chinese on the horizon there's perhaps the Indians as well so things are changing within the region, and this news that Syria is joining the Arab League is just one additional part of that entire puzzle. We're celebrating turning 20 with another Q&A episode, just like our 10th. So if there's any subject you think is wildly appropriate, be it geopolitics, China, Chile, anything in between, contemporary or even historical, do send your questions through to the lads. Uh, you can send them to multipolaritythepodcast at gmail.com or just at us on Twitter, at multipolarpod. Thanks. We are fresh from a huge victory. I don't know any other nation that can say, comparing what it said 40 years earlier with what then finally happened, which can say it has so completely achieved its objective.